Do you have time for a complicated scheme that'll solve all your problems? Roger, this is no time to sell me on Christianity. The complex and confusing trinity is not true, and monotheism is a myth. The myth of monotheism feeds into the trick of the trinity. Monotheism can mean different things to different people. Here is the definition of monotheism that I will show to be false in this video. Monotheism from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Belief in the existence of one God. This definition of monotheism is false. A true scriptural definition of monotheism will be revealed in 4 minutes and 43 seconds. And here's how the myth of monotheism feeds into the trick of the Trinity. If you are a monotheist believing that there exists only one Theos God, then you see that Jesus is called Theos God in the scriptures. You now have two gods, but that's not possible according to your false monotheism. So you will squeeze Jesus into the one Theos God in order to maintain your false monotheism. Now Jesus is part of the one Theos God that actually has three members, the so-called Trinity, when you also include the Holy Spirit as God, which monotheist Trinitarians do. But Jesus is distinct from God and can be termed God because the scriptures in fact speak of more than one Theos God, even in addition to Jesus and his Father. The English word monotheism, first used by Henry Moore in 1660, comes from the Greek monos, which means only, without another, or alone, and the Greek theos, which is based on the Greek root the, which means to put or place, therefore theos means placer. Hence the English word monotheism means only theos, which we can understand as only placer. Theos is translated into English as small g God or big g God. The word God is not a proper name. It is a title. Yahweh is the proper name of the only true God. The word God tells us Yahweh's office and what he actually does. He is the placer. Is there only one Theos in the scriptures? Let's take a look. The Greek word Theos occurs over 1,320 times in various forms in the Greek scriptures. The vast majority of these occurrences are in connection with the only true God, but not all of them are in connection with the only true God. Theos is also used in reference to Jesus, the Son of God. And Theos is used for some of the crappy leaders in Israel. And believe it or not, Theos is used for... Could it be... Satan? Correct, church lady. Satan. And believe it or not, Theos is used for... The bowels. <laughs> FYI, Theoi is the plural of Theos. And the simple fact that there is a plural of Theos in the Greek New Testament should tell us something. If we keep all of the theoi slash gods slash placers in their proper place, it will help us remain in the truth. If we start misplacing the placers, we will end up in error, big time error, like the Trinity. And that would, in a weird sense, make us placers, or rather misplacers of the placers. And doing that is way above any of our pay grades. One of the keys to understanding all of the gods of the scriptures is realizing the word theos doesn't just mean God, which quite honestly is a very vague word. But the Greek word theos entails what God actually does as God, placing people and circumstances and situations as the act of sovereign over all of his creation. As we proceed, I will occasionally insert placer for God and your understanding will expand as you actually see what God does that makes him God. Here is one of the clearest passages in the Greek scriptures that reveals to us the multitude of gods. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 7. Then concerning the feeding on the idol sacrifices, we are aware that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other god, which is Theos, placer, except one. For even if so be that there are those being termed gods, Theoi, which is the plural of Theos, placers, whether in heaven or on earth, even as there are many gods, again, theoi, the plural of theos, placers, and many lords, nevertheless, for us there is one god, theos, placer, 
the Father, out of whom all is, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all is, and we through him. But not in all is there this knowledge. Paul reveals to us clearly the multitude of gods in verse 5. For even if so be that there are those being termed gods, whether in heaven or on earth, even as there are many gods and many lords. Monotheism, defined as the existence of only one theos, is shot all to hell by this passage. But here we also see another definition of monotheism, a true definition, with Paul's words, for us, there is one God, the Father. Paul is saying, yeah, there are a whole bunch of gods, but for me, there is only one God. And who is Paul's one God? The Father. God himself acknowledges the existence of other gods in his commandment to Israel in Exodus 23. You shall have no other gods before me. And the distinctions the Apostle Paul makes between the Father and Jesus are clear. There is one God, Theos, the Father, out of whom all is, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all is, and we through him. Trinitarians blur these distinctions and attempt to move Jesus into the office already fully occupied by the one true God. They do this at their own risk. The one God Paul acknowledges is the Father, all by himself. There's no mythical trinity here. What a perfect spot for Paul to tell us all about the trinity and the godness of Jesus, but not a word. Instead, he acknowledges clearly that for him there is one God, the Father. The Father is the source of everything, and everything comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is never the source, but he is the channel. This does not diminish his glory, but reveals the truth of his glory as the Father's chosen channel for all. Our understandings and descriptions of God should be based solidly in the scriptures. And I think Jesus knew his Father well enough to accurately reveal him to us. In John 17, 3, we see the words of Jesus as he's speaking to his father. Now it is Eonian life that they may know thee, the only true God, and him whom thou dost commission, Jesus Christ. Here we see Jesus acknowledging that his father is the only true God, inferring very heavily that there are other gods because he uses two qualifiers, only and true, to set his father apart from and above any and all other gods, whether false or legitimate gods. I think it's helpful to insert placer for God so we can grasp better what Jesus meant. Now our understanding is enlarged as we see the father is the only true placer. As we saw in the previous passage, everything is out of the Father, and he places everything. And note in this verse one of his placing actions. He commissioned Jesus. The word commission is from the Greek apostello, meaning send officially with authority for the execution of some task. The word apostle is based on this Greek word apostello. Jesus is God's apostle, his sent one. As we continue our study, keep in mind that the only true placer is the source of all placing within the entire creation. The Father always places others, but is never placed by another. The Father always places the Son, but the Son never places the Father. The placing done by God can include moving to a particular location, appointing to a particular office or fate, and assigning to a particular service. Let's look at more evidence from the scriptures proving that the Father, the only true God, is far above all other gods. In Luke 1.32, the angel Gabriel said to Jesus' future mother Mary, speaking of Jesus, He shall be great, the Son of the Most High shall he be called. Do you think Gabriel has a good perspective and good information regarding the only true God, aka the Most High, and other gods? In Mark 5, 7, we read, Jesus, Son of God, Most High. Here, an unclean spirit named Legion acknowledges the only true God's supremacy as Jesus' Father. And in Hebrews 7, 1, we read, For this Melchizedek, King of Salem, priest of God Most High. This again reveals the only true God as the Most High God. The phrase Most High reveals that there are other gods slash theoi slash placers under the Most High, only true God slash theos slash placer. We can see how high the only true God is compared to other gods in Psalm 97.9 in the concordant version of the Old Testament. For you, O Yahweh, are supreme over all the earth. You are exceedingly ascendant over all Elohim. And from the King James Version, For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all 
gods. Elohim is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek theos, and Elohim here is plural. God the Most High, the only true God, is far above, exceedingly ascendant over all other gods. In this next passage, we will see Yahweh appoint a human as a god. Exodus 7.1 in the Concordant Version, Yahweh said to Moses, See, I appoint you and Elohim to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall come to be your prophet. And from the King James Version, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron, thy brother, shall be thy prophet. O oh my God, Yahweh just made another God, another placer, Moses a mere human. Please note the Hebrew Elohim here is plural. Many people point to the plural Elohim in the Hebrew as solid evidence for the Trinity. It is not. Is Moses a Trinity? No. The King James Version and every other translation translates the plural Elohim here as the singular God. The only true God is the one who makes other gods. And next, we'll see the only true God placing humanity according to God's chosen time and location. Paul is speaking in Acts 17.26 to very religious and very ignorant Athenians with the intention to reveal the only true God to them. Besides, he makes out of one every nation of mankind to be dwelling on all the surface of the earth, specifying the settings of the seasons and the bounds of their dwelling for them to be seeking God. The Apostle Paul reveals the only true God to these people by showing that he is the placer of all humanity setting the seasons and the bounds of their dwellings. This is a big hindrance to supposed free will as God brings us into this world, determining when and where and to whom we will be born. Now let's take a look at a very unlikely theos slash placer slash God, Satan, the adversary. We can see the legitimacy of Satan's authority as placer in his temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Luke 4, 5 through 6. And leading Jesus up into a high mountain, the adversary shows him all the kingdoms of the inhabited earth in a second of time. And the adversary said to him, To you shall I be giving all this authority and the glory of them, for it has been given up to me. And to whomsoever I may will, I am giving it. Satan had the legitimate power to place Jesus in authority over all the kingdoms of the earth. Someone gave Satan this power. Who could that be? None other than the only true God, the only true placer. And to prove Satan's authority as a God, the Apostle Paul tells us very clearly that he is a God. 2 Corinthians 4, 3-4 now, if our evangel, which is good message, is covered, also it is covered in those who are perishing, in whom the God of this eon blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving, so that the illumination of the evangel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, does not irradiate them. We see in verse 4 that Satan, the adversary, is the God of this eon, the theos of this eon. As we saw in the previous passage, Satan had the power to place people when Christ was on the earth, and he still has that power as the God placer of this eon. Is Satan a legitimate God slash placer? Yes. Is he a good God slash placer? No. I want to make a vital point from this passage. The word eon is from the Greek ion. If Bible translations that proclaim eternal torment or eternal death by annihilation were consistent, they would translate ion here as eternity. I'm a nice guy, usually, so I'll do that for them and see if they'd be willing to swallow this huge shitty pill. There, how's that look to you, you eternalists? If Ion means eternity, then Satan would be the god of eternity. Are you eternalists willing to be consistent and acknowledge Satan is the god of eternity? Satan's run as god of this eon will end at the end of this wicked eon when he is bound and locked in the submerged chaos. He will be released at the end of the thousand years and resume his deceiving and placing of the sons of stubbornness for a very short time before being cast into the lake of fire. Let's look at an interesting example of the only true placer working through the placer of this wicked eon, Satan, the adversary. In Ephesians 1.11, we read about God, and in Ephesians 2.2, 2, we read about Satan. 1.11 
in him in whom our lot was cast also, being designated beforehand according to the purpose of the one who is operating all in accord with the counsel of his will. 2.2. 2. And you, being dead to your offenses and sins, in which once you walked in accord with the eon of this world, in accord with the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, the spirit now operating in the sons of stubbornness. In Ephesians 1.11, we see that God is operating all in accord with the counsel of his will. Nothing happens apart from God's operating. In 2.2, we see the adversary Satan is now operating in the sons of stubbornness. The same exact Greek word is translated as operating in both verses. Satan's operating in the sons of stubbornness falls within and is subordinate to God's operating of all. Similar to Jesus proclaiming his Father to be the only true placer, it is also true to say that the Father is the only true operator. Satan is the mediator God is using to operate in the sons of stubbornness. I know this may sound amazing to some of you, but we see this truth reinforced in Romans 11.32. Romans 11:32 For God locks up all together in stubbornness. At a quick glance, this can look bad for God to do. Lock up all together in stubbornness. And if we stop there, it wouldn't only look bad, it would be bad. But stubbornness is not the goal. It's only a temporary condition on the way to the goal, which is that he should be merciful to all. The stubbornness that is being affected by God through Satan is part of God's plan and will end in great blessing for all when God, the only true placer, is merciful to all. As we can see from the example of Satan as a theos, the word theos does not carry with it the inherent idea of supremacy, eternal existence, or uncreatedness. So when we think of the word God, we automatically think, the being that has existed forever. That is not what the word theos means as proven by it being applied to Satan. Being a theos does not make one the only true theos or part of the only true theos in a mythical trinity. The office of the only true God is fully occupied by the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and by Him alone. So if you're a monotheist trinitarian who believes that only one Theos exists, what are you going to do with the fact that Satan is the Theos of this wicked eon? Are you going to attempt to squeeze him into the Trinity also? Please give me your answer in the comments below and please use scripture to support your answer. Thank you. Now let's zero in on Jesus who is another placer in the scriptures. Remember the Father is the big boss placing the Son here and there and everywhere everywhere the Father desires. But the Son is never placing the Father. John 3.17 For God does not dispatch His Son into the world that He should be judging the world, but that the world may be saved through Him. God placed His Son on this dirty ball of death so He could die to save the world. And that's exactly what Jesus did in perfect obedience to His Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Wherefore also God highly exalts Him and graces Him with the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial and subterranean, and every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. After Jesus' perfect obedience and resurrection, God then highly exalted him and graced him with the highest name. But note, even at Jesus' high exaltation, he will be acclaimed as Lord, not as God. Very interesting. The Apostle Peter, preaching in Jerusalem after the resurrection of Jesus, Let all the house of Israel know certainly then that God makes him Lord as well as Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. Here we see clearly that the Father is the one making Jesus Lord and Christ and placing him in those very high and esteemed positions. The only true God is the source of Jesus and everything Jesus has and everything Jesus does. John 5, 26. For even as the Father has life in himself, thus to the Son also he gives to have life in himself. John 5, 30. I cannot do anything of myself according as I am hearing and my judging. And my judging is just, for I am not seeking my will, but the will of him who sends me. 
John 6, 57. According as the living Father commissions me, I also am living because of the Father. The Father commissions Jesus. The Father gives Jesus life. Everything that Jesus has is dependent upon his Father. The Father is dependent upon no one. In John 17, 22, Jesus is speaking to his Father, And I have given the disciples the glory which thou hast given me. Some have tried to tell me that God and his Son share the same glory. But in reality, God gave Jesus Jesus' own unique glory that Jesus can give to others. The only true God does not give his glory to others, as we can see from Isaiah 42, 8. And my glory I shall not give to another. If we would just listen to Jesus in the scriptures, we would see and understand the vast distinctions between him and his father. Are you willing to hear him? John 14, 28, Jesus says, The father is greater than I. 1 Corinthians 11, 3 tells us that the head of Christ is God. Ephesians 1, 17 tells us about the God, the theos placer of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory. Hebrews 1, 8 through 9 in the Greek scriptures is taken from Psalm 45, 6 through 7 in the Hebrew scriptures and is a very interesting passage as the only true God addresses his son as God, Theos, Placer, Elohim. Hebrews 1, 8 through 9, the only true God is speaking. Yet to the Son, thy throne, O God, is for the eon of the eon, and a scepter of rectitude is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest injustice. Therefore thou art anointed by God, thy God, with the oil of exaltation beyond thy partners. Psalm 45, 6-7. The only true God is speaking. Your throne, O Elohim, is for the eon and further. A scepter of equity is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of elation beyond your partners. In these passages, we see that the Father anoints the Son beyond the Son's partners. Again, we see the Hebrew Elohim in the plural when referring to the Son individually and to the Father individually. Does this mean the Son is a trinity by himself and the Father is another trinity by himself just because the plural Elohim is used? No. What we are seeing here is simply that the only true God, the only true placer, created his Son to be another placer under him, through whom the only true God does his placing. If we maintain the distinctions between the Father and Son as revealed in the scriptures, they are both glorified. The Father maintains his unique glory, and Jesus maintains his unique glory. Some Trinitarians have argued with me, saying believers have always believed in the Trinity. And amusingly enough, some Trinitarians tell me that believers have always believed in the Nicene Creed, which was written around 325 AD, which is about 300 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. How could they believe in a creed that was written 300 years later? So there were no believers from the time of Christ's resurrection until the Nicene Creed was written. I, I don't get it. I'm just telling you what they told me. I think their facts is messed up. Some of these Trinitarians will point to the Nicene Creed as strong support for the Trinity, which if it was true, the Nicene Creed, it would be strong support for the Trinity. As I said, it was written around 325 AD and was foundational in establishing the Trinity as the popular conception of God. I want to take a quick look at a small part, a very small part of that Nicene Creed and compare it to the words of Jesus. In John 17, 3, Jesus said, Now it is Aeonian life that they may know thee, the only true God, and him whom thou dost commission, Jesus Christ. The Nicene Creed, on the other hand, says, We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. The Nicene Creed attempts to tell us that Jesus, the Son of God, is true God from true God. But Jesus told us that his Father is the only true God. Somebody's trying to pull a fast one, and it ain't Jesus! The creeds of men are meaningless. The scriptures must be our source of truth because they are the source of truth, not the creeds. 
let's take a look at the word theos referring to the Son of God. John 1, 18. God no one has ever seen. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he unfolds him. We see clearly here that the only true God is unseen. Christ, the only begotten God, Theos, is seen, and he is God's creative original, Revelation 3.14. And Philippians 2.6 tells us that Jesus was inherently in the form of God. Colossians 1.15 The Son is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature. Colossians 2.9 In Christ, the entire complement of the deity is dwelling bodily. If someone sees Jesus, they are seeing God. He is the image of his invisible Father. And that is one of the greatest aspects of the glory of Christ, to reveal the invisible Father to the creation. Being the image of the only true God and having the fullness of the deity dwelling in him does not make Jesus the only true God. But that in no way diminishes the great glory of the Son of God. And notice in Colossians 1.15, it says Jesus is the firstborn of every creature. This too is one of his great glories, the first to come from the Father. You are not seeing the only true West Fallen Camp. The only true West Fallen Camp created this moving image of himself that you are now watching and listening to. The only true West Fallen Camp sent this moving image out so that you can see and hear the only true West Fallen Camp. This moving image of the only true West Fallen Camp that you are experiencing represents perfectly the only true West Fallen Camp. This moving image of the only true West Fallen Camp can rightfully be called West Fallen Camp as is done at the beginning of every video and I am doing right now. If someone looks over your shoulder while you're watching this moving image of the only true West Fallen Camp and asks, hey, who's that very handsome man that you're watching? You can truthfully say, oh, that's just West Fallen Camp and I don't find him one bit handsome, not even half a bit. The only true West Fallen Camp would not be insulted or diminished one bit if you wrote in the comments of this video after experiencing his moving image, you are the most handsome man ever created. In fact, when the only true West Fallen Camp reads those comments, he will be very happy with those comments. Because those comments, even though made because you watched the moving image of the only true West Fallen Camp, glorify the only true West Fallen Camp. In the same way, you cannot see the only true God, for he is invisible. So, the only true God created a moving image of himself. That moving image is his son. The invisible only true God sent out the moving image of his son so you could see and hear and know the only true God. Jesus, the moving image of the only true God, is not the only true God. Jesus, the moving image of the only true God, perfectly represents the only true God. Jesus, the moving image of the only true God, can rightfully be called God, just as Thomas did when he called Jesus my Lord and my God. Jesus being called God does not insult or diminish the only true God one bit. In fact, the only true God is glorified in that because he sent his son as his perfect image to represent him to show people who the only true God is. So if and when Jesus is called God, that proves that he is doing his job as the perfect image of the only true God perfectly. And his being the perfect image of the only true God glorifies the only true God as the creation gets to see and hear the perfect image of the only true invisible God. Because Jesus so perfectly represents his father, he can make bold statements like these to Thomas and Philip. John 14, 7 through 9, Jesus speaking initially to Thomas, If you had known me, you would have known my father also, and henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip is saying to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficing us. Jesus is saying to him, So much time I am with you and you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father, and how are you saying, Show us the father? Just as Satan in the future will no longer be a placer, Jesus, the Son of God, will in the future no longer be a placer. This is based on the fact that eventually, at the consummation of the eons, 
God will be all in all and will no longer use mediaries by whom he places. He will place everyone directly. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. When God is all in all in his entire creation, there will be no more mediaries. There is one final group of gods I want to look at that is very enlightening in addition to disproving monotheism and the Trinity. In John 10, 29 through 36, Jesus is addressing a very tough Jewish crowd. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to be snatching them out of my father's hand. I and the father, we are one. Again, then the Jews bear stones that they should be stoning him. Jesus answered them, many ideal acts I show you from my father. Because of what act of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, for an ideal act we are not stoning you, but for blasphemy and that you, being a man, are making yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law that I say you are gods? If he said those were gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be annulled, are you saying to him whom the Father hollows and dispatches into the world that you are blaspheming, seeing that I said, Son of God am I? This passage is very fat with pertinent truth. In verse 29, Jesus acknowledges his father is greater than all. And in verse 30, he and his father are one. The Jews were consistently misunderstanding the truth, so they loaded up so they could rock Jesus to sleep. In verse 32, Jesus asked them why they wanted to rock him to sleep. In verse 33, they accused him of blaspheming by making himself God, meaning the only true God, which he did not do. Remember, he just said his father was greater than all. In verse 34, Jesus latched onto their false accusation and referred back to Psalm 82 to show them that their monotheism was false. In Psalm 82, the only true God himself addressed the crappy leaders in Israel, calling them gods, acknowledging their legitimate status as gods slash placers. God judged them for their poor performance as judges in Israel. If Jesus was called God, there would be no crime, unless these Jews were willing to convict God himself for calling the Israelite leaders gods. There's a big difference between making yourself God, the only true God, and legitimately being called God, as these crappy leaders in Israel were called. These Jews did not recognize the distinctions between the Son of God and the Father. Their false monotheism was tricking them. None of those termed Theos in the scriptures are the only true God except the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not a part of the only true God. Satan, Moses, the crappy leaders in Israel, not even your bowels are part of the only true God. If you come to the scriptures with the false belief that there is only one Theos in existence, and you maintain that belief even after seeing all of this evidence, you must somehow squeeze all of the other theoi into this one theos of monotheism. Let go of your false idea of monotheism and understand that there are many gods in the scriptures, but there is only one true God, as Jesus himself said. Monotheistic Trinitarians, stop misplacing the placers. They don't need your help. You are mixing worthless elements with the truth, and the Trinity is one of the most worthless elements ever created. Jesus is elevated high enough and has a unique enough glory that he does not need your assistance in trying to move him into the office that is fully occupied by his father as the only true God. That office always has been and always will be fully occupied by one the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures reveal the similarities and the distinctions between the Father and His Son. We must fall in line and follow these truths as laid down in the scriptures. Monotheism is a myth. The Trinity is a trick, a damaging trick of the adversary, a doctrine of demons. Acknowledge the unique glory of the Father as the only true God, and acknowledge the unique glory of his Son as the true and perfect image representing his Father to the entire creation. If this video has helped you in any way, please click that thumbs up button. I've heard that can help get these videos out to more people. More people need to hear these big truths of God. And if you've stuck around this long, I thank you. And now I invite you to watch this video next. Could it be?